on World News Tonight. War rages on. Ukraine braces itself for more attacks by Russia. Ukraine forces are regaining more ground as Russian forces withdraw from Chernobyl. Historic move. To ease record gas prices, President Biden taps the U.S. strategic oil reserves. How soon can the prices affect at the pump? Find out tonight. Severe storms. Deadly tornadoes hit Florida and it moves up the East Coast, destroying homes and other infrastructure. Rescue efforts are underway as survivors fight against rapid winds. And shuttle in the dark. Badminton halls glow in the dark, as do the rackets, clothes and shuttlecocks, enticing Malaysian players. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening, thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Russian invasion of Ukraine is still leading as a top story around the world. In a late night address, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky warned of battles ahead in Donbass and the besieged southern port city of Mariupol. Ukraine is bracing for new attacks from Russia, with leader Volodymyr Zelensky warning late Thursday of battles ahead. He said the situation in the south and southwestern Donbass region remained extremely difficult and also said again that Russia was building up forces near the besieged port city of Mariupol. Also in the Donbass, in Mariupol, in the Kharkiv direction, the Russian troops are accumulating the potential for strikes, powerful strikes. We will defend ourselves. We will do everything we can to stop the occupiers and cleanse our land of their evil and senseless chimeras. And in a rare sign of internal dissent, Zelensky also announced he was firing two generals on the grounds they were traitors. Those high-ranking servicemen who have been prevented from deciding where their homeland is, who break the military oath of allegiance to the Ukrainian people for the protection of our state, its freedom and independence, will inevitably be deprived of high military ranks. Earlier on Thursday, a Russian missile strike in the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv hit gas pipes, cutting off supplies to tens of thousands of people there. Kharkiv, the country's second largest city, has suffered some of the heaviest shelling since Russia invaded Ukraine more than a month ago. Zelensky, however, said his forces had pushed back the Russian military from the capital Kiev and the nearby city of Chernihiv. At talks this week, Moscow said it would reduce offensives in both cities as a goodwill gesture and focus on what it called liberating Donbass. After weeks of constant shelling, the city of Mariupol has no running water, gas or electricity, another obstacle for those who remain as they fight to survive. A spokesperson for Mariupol's mayor said on Monday nearly 5,000 people had already been killed. Ukrainian authorities were hoping to evacuate more residents from Mariupol after Russia agreed to open a humanitarian corridor on Friday. But several previous deals have collapsed. Russia says it is carrying out a special operation to disarm and denazify its neighbor. But it denies Kiev's accusations that they are targeting civilians. Western countries say Putin's real aim was to topple Ukraine's government. Peace negotiations are set to resume by video conference on Friday. Russian President Vladimir Putin said he had signed a decree saying foreign buyers must pay in rubles for Russian gas as of today and contracts would be halted if these payments aren't made. In late February, Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine from three fronts. Western allies hit Russia with sweeping sanctions in response to what Moscow calls its special military operation in Ukraine. If foreign buyers want Russian gas, they will have to pay in rubles from Friday. That was the message from President Vladimir Putin on Thursday, who signed a decree on the matter. I've signed a decree today that sets the rules of the Russian natural gas trade with so-called unfriendly states. We are offering our contracting parties from such countries a clear and transparent agreement. To buy Russian gas, they should open ruble accounts in Russian banks and pay for gas from these accounts, delivered starting from tomorrow, April 1st of this year. <coughs> Western companies and governments have rejected the move as a breach of existing contracts, which are set in euros or dollars. 
German Chancellor Olaf Scholz was blunt. We have looked at the contracts for the gas supplies and the other supplies, and in these it says that the payment will be in euros, sometimes in dollars, but usually in euros. Russia supplies about a third of Europe's gas. Energy is therefore a powerful bargaining point for Putin as he tries to hit back against Western sanctions over Ukraine. If these payments are not being accomplished, we would consider it as buyers' failure to meet their commitments with all the relevant consequences. Nobody sells anything to us for free. Neither are we going to do charity work. That means the current contracts would be brought to a halt. His decision to enforce ruble payments has boosted the Russian currency after it fell to historic lows following the invasion of Ukraine, which Russia calls a special military operation. Labeling it a moment of patriotism, U.S. President Joe Biden has ordered an unprecedented release of America's emergency oil reserves in a last-ditch attempt to bring down fuel costs in the United States. Regarding the war in Ukraine, Biden said Putin appears to be self-isolated and there are indications he may have fired some of his aides due to what Putin perceived as bad military advice. The White House has announced the largest release of the U.S. emergency oil reserve, calling on oil companies to pump more to bring down gas prices that have skyrocketed even more following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Today, I'm authorizing the release of one million barrels per day for the next six months, over 180 million barrels for the strategic, from, the, from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. This is a wartime bridge to increase oil supply until production ramps up later this year. And it is by far the largest release of our, net, of our national reserve in our history. The 180 million barrel release is equivalent to about two days of global demand. It will more than cover oil exports to the U.S. from Russia, which President Biden had earlier banned. Following Biden's announcement, the price of the U.S. benchmark West Texas Intermediate slid more than 7 percent a barrel, while the Brent crude fell some 5.4 percent. He also called on Congress to make companies pay a fee if they choose not to utilize oil wells on land they've leased from the government. In addition, he also urged lawmakers to pass his plan to move the country toward clean energy policies. Regarding Russia, Biden said President Putin appears to be, quote, self-isolated, and there are indications that suggest he may have fired or put under house arrest some of his advisors as a result of Moscow's war with Ukraine. Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan rejected opposition calls for him to resign and accused an unnamed Western country of backing moves to oust him because he had visited Moscow recently for talks with President Vladimir Putin. Khan has faced mounting criticism of his performance, including management of troubled economy of the nuclear-armed country. He faced a tough parliamentary no-confidence vote, seeking to oust him from power. The vote has become increasingly difficult for Khan since he lost his majority in parliament when his main ally quit his coalition. He could see the former cricket star ousted and the return of political uncertainty. Earlier, opposition parties called on him to resign ahead of the parliamentary vote. A parliamentary debate on the vote against Khan was to begin, but the Speaker of the Assembly, a member of Khan's party, immediately adjourned the session to to Sunday. Political analysts said Khan enjoyed the support of the military when he won an election to become Prime Minister in 2018, but he later lost the general's favour over various wrangles. Khan has denied ever having the backing of the military, and the military, which has ruled Pakistan for about half its history, denies involvement in civilian politics. The actions of Operation Dudula, an anti-migrant South African vigilante group, have raised fears of renewed violence against foreigners in the country. Put South Africa first. This is the slogan of anti-migrant group Operation Dadula on a march through Hillbrow, an inner city suburb in Johannesburg with a large population of African migrants. The protesting group demand that migrants leave and that their jobs go to South Africans. Operation Dadula has been linked to violent incidents in townships against foreigners who came from all over Africa. Dadula means push back in Zulu. The group, based in the Soweto township just outside Johannesburg, blames high crime rates on undocumented migrants. They also accuse them of taking jobs away from South Africans and driving down wages. South Africa's official unemployment rate is at a record 35.3%, though it is even higher by other measures. 
The group's activities have raised fears of renewed violence against foreigners. Campaigners for migrant rights say foreigners are being used as scapegoats for economic woes. Activists have also warned that an increasing number of politicians were making statements hostile to migrants. They have cited the recent suspension of a special permit for Zimbabwean migrants as a sign of growing official hostility. South Africa's president, Cyril Ramaphosa, said those behind Operation Dadula were contravening the law. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Top military officers from South Korea and the U.S. signed a document that's expected to lead to an updated war plan in the event of conflict with Pyongyang. The Allies agreed in principle on procedures to counter the regime's increasing nuclear threats. A trilateral meeting involving their Japanese counterpart was also held. Senior military leaders from South Korea and the U.S. have signed the Strategic Planning Directive, or SPD, moving one step closer to updating their war plan to counter new threats. It was signed in a bilateral meeting in Hawaii on Wednesday local time by the chairman of South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Won in and his American counterpart, General Mark Milley. The SPD signed on Wednesday was developed as a follow-up to the new Strategic Planning Guidance, or SPG, that the Allies approved last December, when they agreed to update their war plans to counter North Korea's increasing nuclear threats. The earlier guidance sets the tone for the updated war plan and led to Wednesday's signing of the Strategic Planning Directive. With the SPD in place, some experts now think the new war plan could be ready within one or two years. The existing war plan was created based on guidelines set in 2010, so it's likely that the new plan will be updated to reflect changes in the North Korea's military capabilities. Also on Wednesday in Hawaii, the two generals held talks with their Japanese counterpart, General Koji Yamazaki. The three countries reaffirmed their close cooperation aimed at achieving regional security. They also exchanged views on multilateral cooperation and training in order to enhance peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region. Trilateral meetings like this one are normally held once or twice a year, the last one almost a year ago last April. Severe weather is sweeping the east coast of the United States after pounding the south. Residents are now picking up the pieces of whatever they can find and according to reports, the storm is moving upwards. It's the alarm sounding in cities across the South. A massive, fast-moving storm system producing more than 400 weather warnings across at least 16 states, with more than two dozen reported tornadoes. It vibrated the house. I just kept reassuring my family, we're going to be okay, we're okay, we're okay. Officials say the storm claimed two lives in the Florida panhandle and sent winds whipping through Alabama and Mississippi destroying Teresa Love's new home before she could even move in. It's devastating. It was going to be a home for me and my kids. And in parts of Louisiana, still reeling from last week's tornado outbreak, another direct hit. Now millions along the East Coast are feeling the storm's impact, the final stop in what's been an unforgiving path. Amazon workers at a warehouse in New York City's Staten Island have so far voted 57% in favor of unionizing with a final tally due, a potential landmark victory for organized labor at the second largest U.S. private employer. A vote for Amazon workers to unionize in New York's Staten Island showed a strong lead in favor of the move on Thursday, but the union narrowly lost a parallel contest in Alabama that has yet to be finalized. A win in either state would be a landmark victory for labor advocates and a historic first for the retail giant, the second largest private employer in the country. Nearly 60 percent of the 2,700 votes counted at Amazon's Staten Island warehouse so far have been in favor of a union. Amazon has warned against unionizing in fierce campaigns with notices in bathroom stalls and mandatory meetings telling workers that labor groups could force them to strike. Stand up, fight back! In Bessemer, Alabama, organizers believe Amazon's actions may have affected their vote to unionize, with 53 percent of workers voting no. But 416 challenged ballots remain, with the potential to change the result entirely. The U.S. National Labor Relations Board said it would hold a hearing in the next few weeks to determine whether any of those ballots should be opened and counted. Meanwhile, the president of the union organizing the Alabama effort, Stuart Applebaum, says the group plans to file objections to Amazon's conduct around the election. 
The National Labor Relations Board determined that Amazon improperly interfered in Bessemer's original contest and called for a rerun this year based off the union's previous objections. Amazon did not immediately comment on the union's plans to object or on Thursday's vote counts. Using NASA's Hubble Space Telescope, scientists have discovered the most distant individual star on record, a bright behemoth they nicknamed Arendelle, Old English for Morning Star, because it existed during the dawn of the universe. Scientists have discovered the most distant individual star on record using NASA's Hubble Space Telescope. It's a bright behemoth they nicknamed Arendelle, Old English for Morning Star, because it existed during the dawn of the universe. Brian Welch is an astronomer at Johns Hopkins University. So normally when we look at very distant objects, what we're seeing is the light from an entire galaxy. So millions of stars all blended together. Uh, and we've been able to see those out to even further distances. But um, in this case, thanks to a very massive cluster of galaxies in the foreground, uh, the light from this one star has just been very, very highly magnified. Uh, so we're able to see this single star um, at uh, a much greater distance. Arendelle was born nearly 900 million years after the Big Bang event at the outset of the universe. Researchers said the star was estimated at 50 to 100 times the mass of our sun, while also being millions of times brighter. Its light traveled 12.9 billion years before reaching Earth. In observing objects as distant as Arendelle, Scientists are peering into the deep past because of the vast distance the light from the star traveled to reach Earth, in a sense using Hubble as a time machine. Until now, the most distant single star on record was one named Icarus that existed four billion years after Arendelle. Arendelle itself certainly no longer exists, with such stars having relatively short lifespans according to Welch. It existed for perhaps a few hundred million years before dying in a supernova explosion. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Italy's COVID-19 state of emergency comes to an end Friday, two years after it was declared. Starting a new phase for the country, Rome is lifting emergency legislation and has eased many antivirus rules. This includes scrapping mandatory quarantine for those in contact with people infected with COVID, as well as the use of a digital vaccination certificate which will no longer be required at outdoor facilities. One of the first countries in Europe to be hit by the pandemic, Italy has since recorded 14.5 million infections and over 150,000 deaths. A massive fire in southern Chile has burned up to 80 acres of land while destroying at least 40 homes. Locals of the town of Laguna Verde were seen alongside firefighters trying to put out the fire as authorities worked to prevent the fire from advancing towards residential areas. Blue Origin's new Shepard spacecraft completed its fourth flight with a crew, returning successfully to West Texas after taking a half a dozen passengers for a 10-minute suborbital joyride. The flight came two days later than scheduled as poor weather conditions forced the mission to be postponed earlier this week. Starting this month, Google is enforcing mandatory use of the company's billing system for Play Store apps. Industry sources say that Google Play Store notified app developers not to direct consumers to external payment systems by deleting such links by today. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. In case you have missed any of the stories we had tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other than English. We're leaving you tonight with visuals of neon lights running along the wall, pulsating electronic beats, and a glowing red shuttlecock bouncing back and forth, as one could have easily mistaken this sports venue for the set of a sci-fi film. Thank you for watching. Good night.